going to continue on with our series here on repentance and communion and uh, all that means and all that entails. And uh, we're getting waiting here. The hourglass is spinning. Okay. So, anyway, this is, uh, we're, we're just continuing on with, you know, just one thing that's very important in the prophetic is when. When God gives you a prophetic word, it's not just to be something that gives you an emotional high or like, well, okay, God spoke. It's to be worked out, fleshed out, to become flesh in you and also flesh in a community and a corporate people. And so the word of the Lord that, that uh, Terry gave us was that we are to, um, to spend some time in repentance and take communion and to seal the work that God accomplished among us. And so we, I talked all about that last Sunday. I'm not going to rehash that. But what I wanted to do this Sunday was talk about communion and what or the Lord's Supper, whichever way you want to talk about. And, you know, a lot of us have like, I, I think this is really true. A lot of us don't really even know why we drink the juice and the cracker. We just do it because that's what we've been doing. I know that was the case for me until about two years ago. It's just kind of like you start off and it's just like what you grow up with. I don't know. They just pass it out once a month or however frequently you do it. Especially if you're Catholic, you have this, you know, this thing where every single Sunday you take communion. But we don't really understand the significance of it. And we don't understand the weight of it. And that was the case for me until about two years ago when the Lord started revealing to me what, the, uh, what communion is and what it's meant to be. And all that's entailed in communion. So I just want to do a teaching on this. I've never taught on communion before. But, you know, it all, almost sounds like, well, that sounds kind of boring. Honestly, like, we, it's just because the ritual of it has so... I guess, dulled down the meaning of what it's meant to be. But as I studied this, it was like, wow, this is incredible what God has uh, offered to us in the, in the blood and, and drinking the, from the cup and eating from the bread and all that means. So let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. And Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 Corinthians 11, he's talking about communion. He really is comparing it with the idolatry and the, the table of demons in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. They were practicing the, the mill sacrifice to pagans. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? And I'm going I'm to drill into the meanings of this in a minute. I just want to lay out the scripture for us right now. Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Okay, I want us to rethink communion. Okay, maybe you already have thought through communion and, and you're, you've come into the, the, the right understanding of communion, but communion is not meant to be this ritualistic, mechanical thing we do where we hand out juice and a cracker and we, you know, say the same thing every time. You know, that's kind of the mindset I had growing up in a Baptist church where, you know, we would do communion. You don't really get the meaning of it and you just do it because it's passed around and all that. But when I really started digging in to the real meaning of communion, my mind changed. And especially if you grew up Catholic, you probably have this, this mentality of ritual of what communion is and of this ritualistic mechanical thing that we do and it's lost the meaning of it. But I believe God wants to bring us back to the reality that, we, that in taking communion, we are meant to come into an encounter with Christ uh, afresh. We're meant to have a spiritual encounter with Christ through the benefits and the blessings of his shed blood and through the benefits and the blessings of his broken body. It's not just meant to be something we check off our religious to-do list and say, okay, check, check, check. We did that. No, communion is so serious that Paul warns about the Corinthians. And he said, some of you are sick and some of you have died because you did not discern what you were doing. Okay, that's real serious. Okay, that is so much more than just eat, drinking some grape juice and eating a cracker. 
That's really, really brings it on to serious ground. And I, I just, I'm just going to say, I don't believe a lot of the church really has an understanding of what communion and the essence of communion is all about. It's so powerful, but it's it so serious that God's saying, okay, you've got to make sure you understand what communion is. So we need to rethink communion. And, and when I say rethink, I'm not talking about anything outside of Scripture. I'm talking about rethinking it for, out of our religious mindsets. We all carry into this religious mindsets, religious perspectives of what we think communion is. We need to rethink it from this place of religion into this place of profound spiritual encounter with Christ, where his blood begins to bless us in a real way, where his broken body begins to bless us in a way that brings spiritual transformation to us. See, when we take the cup and we take the bread and we drink and we eat, we are bringing into ourselves by the Holy Spirit bringing us into this a profound encounter with the benefits and the blessings of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the broken body of Jesus Christ. We're coming into that. The Holy Spirit brings us into this encounter with him where we share in the benefits of that. And so if we don't have understanding of what communion really is, it becomes mechanical. It becomes religious. It becomes a to-do list we check off instead of realizing, no, this is a profound, profound spiritual experience. We are meant to experience Christ and his grace afresh every single time we partake in communion. So that said... One of my goals is to help you understand this message. One of my goals is to help you rethink communion, to exchange a wrong perspective based in dead religion into the life-giving, transformational aspect that communion is meant to be. And so we got to understand what is communion. Let's talk about what is communion. I read it, uh, we just read it a minute ago, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The context is Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 is addressing the Corinthians who were trying to mix in idolatry and the table, he called it the table of demons with the table of the Lord. And they were mixing in the, the communion with the Lord and the table of demons and idolatry because what Paul was, Paul had the revelation. What Paul was saying is you can't mix in demons and Christ. You cannot mix the two in. You cannot mix those two things in. You cannot share in the table of demons and in the table of the Lord because what Paul knew is when you partake of that meal, when you partake of that, 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 the bread and the wine, you are sharing in that spiritual experience. And so Paul was saying, he was addressing the Corinthians. That's the context here. Now let's break apart here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? And of course, the, the, the cup represents, it's a symbol. The cup is a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. So this means that when we drink that cup, we are recognizing and we are participating in the benefits of Christ's atonement in a fresh way. The more and more I've thought about this, I, I, you know, I'm writing a book right now just on the basics of salvation I mean, it's not, it's deep, but it's, and when I say basic, it's foundational, but it's not simple. Um, and just been thinking about the atonement a lot lately and just thinking about the, the depravity of man and just watching this, you know, just seeing the world unfold the way the world is unfolding right now. It's like, how, I mean, if we don't believe in the depravity of man, the, the depravity of humanity after just watching what's going on right now in our world unfold, just complete and total depravity. I feel like, you know, I'm not trying to depress you, but it's like, it's got me to this place where I'm like, our only hope, our only hope is the atonement of Jesus Christ. That is our only hope, truly. And you just read Romans chapter 1. He lays it out, the depraved Gentiles. 
He lays it out in Romans chapter 2, the hypocritical, uh, self-righteous people who judge others, but they do the same things themselves. He lays it out of the, the Jews who had the law but were breaking the law. And he gets to his place in Romans chapter 3, and he says, there is no one who is righteous, no, not one. There is no one who seeks after God. There is no one who is righteous. And you just you walk away with that going, okay, there's literally... It brings you to this place where you feel like there is literally no hope. And he says the only way we can ever be right before God is by keeping the law and to obey the law, 16 and 613 commandments of the law, obeying those laws perfectly in thought, motive, and deed. No one has ever been able to do that except for Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, he brings us in Romans chapter 3 to the sacrifice of the cross and the atoning work of the cross that Jesus had to become sin. Jesus had to become the sin offering, and the sins of the world had to be imputed upon Jesus Christ on the cross. And as an offering for sin, Jesus substituted himself in your place so that the full penalty for sin would be paid. So you do not have to pay that penalty in hell. That is the glory of the gospel. And when we partake of communion, we're coming into that that experience of fresh of the cross. The cross should be the foundation of everything that we do. Paul said to the Corinthians when he wanted to preach to them, he said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Corinthians were wanting, okay, no, give us this eloquent speech. Give us this worldly wisdom and this this insight. We want to know the the wisdom and the higher ways. And Paul was like, I determined to know nothing among that among you. Because I've seen all that. It's empty rhetoric. It does nothing to bring transformation. The only thing that can transform a man or a woman is the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the, the atoning work of Jesus Christ. The the finished work of Jesus Christ, when Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, that brought about a complete change in history. And now the Spirit, as he brings us into that experience of the cross, we go deeper into experiential transformation. The cross is the power of God to those who are being saved. We've got to get, the church has got to get back to the preaching of the cross. The church has got to get back to the experiencing of the cross. The cross has to become central. The person of Christ and his finished work on the cross and the daily application of that cross into our lives has to become central once again in the church because it is the only thing that brings transformation. And so when we, when we take the cup and we eat the bread, these, the cup and the bread are symbols, but these, these are not just to be a symbolic, ritualistic experience. What these symbols do is the Holy Spirit then brings us into this spiritually, into the, the, the fresh experience of the blood of Jesus Christ and the fresh experience of the body of Jesus Christ. Well, how do you know that? Because... The Greek word for sharing is the word koinonia. And if you probably, if you've been in the church for a while, you probably have heard the word koinonia. This word, I love, this is a really rich, beautiful word. This word koinonia means a fellowship, a participation, a communion. It's a profound word that speaks of intimate connection and spiritual union. And I like to think, this is the way I like to think of this word communion or or koinonia. It means experience. It means intimate experience. So when you get back into the text, is not the cup an experience, an intimate experience of the blood of Christ? Now, obviously, that doesn't mean you literally have blood on you. Obviously, that's not what it means. Obviously, the the juice doesn't become blood. That's not what it means. Obviously, we don't, we don't, the, the broken body doesn't become the actual body of Christ. It's a symbol of it, but the, it's a symbol, but the Holy Spirit takes that symbol and the Holy Spirit begins to apply it to you in a spiritual way so that you come into the experience, till you come into the fresh sharing in of the benefits once again of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, 
that's where God's grace begins to flow afresh into your life. The amazing grace of God. See, when we come and we partake of communion, we partake of communion in faith, and we partake of it with an expectation, and we partake of communion in a preparation, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, what happens is then the grace of the living God begins to flow into that, that partaking and that you begin to come into the experience of the blood and the experience of the body and all that it means as it's revealed in the gospel. So the cup, while it's a symbol, it's, it's, not, it's, a, it's more than just a symbol. It's a sharing or a participation or an experience of what we are remembering. Now, when we talk about the blood and just some of the benefits of the blood, you can just read it through scriptures, just do a word search on, on the blood of Christ, and you see, wow, the benefits of the blood of Christ. Oh, the power in the blood. There is power, wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so when we take that cup and we drink that cup, what happens is the power, the Holy Spirit, the, his power is activated to make that, the, the spiritual experience of the blood real in you. The blood pro provides forgiveness of your sins. How many of us, we need forgiveness of our sins daily? The blood provides forgiveness. The blood provides redemption, that God redeems us. Like I said, we, if we really got the, the, the real reality of who we are apart from Jesus Christ, we are totally, every one of us are totally depraved apart from Christ. In our flesh, there dwells no good thing. Our flesh cannot submit to the law of God. Our flesh is in hostility to the, to the uh, law of God. We cannot submit to God. We are rebellious, proud, narcissists, selfish who want our way the way we want it without Christ. That is the condition of every man and woman who's ever lived because of Adam's sin. And we need redemption. And we need justification. The blood of Jesus Christ justifies you. How beautiful. That's what Paul talked about in Romans chapter 5. The blood of Jesus when it's shed for you on the cross, his blood justifies you. Justification means that we are, when, because when we are saved, we're born again. The spirit of God who comes to dwell within us, he baptizes us into the body of Jesus Christ so that therefore we are in Christ. And therefore, because we are in Christ, we are now righteous in Christ. And because we are now righteous in Christ, God looks at us and he says, you are declared righteous. That's just not a declaration for the past sins you have committed. That is a status that you enjoy forever as you are in Christ by faith. That is what the blood does for us. He justifies us. He says, I declare you righteous in Christ. If we really want to move on to sanctification and holiness and purity and the Lord doing that internal work within us, then we've got to do it from the foundation of justification. We've got to do it from victory, not for victory. We've got to do it from acceptance, not for acceptance. We've got to do it from love, not for love. We've got to do it from the basis of justification by faith. His blood has now justified you. His blood has made you as if you have never sinned. His blood, because you are in Christ, says you are righteous. His blood now cleanses you from every sin and defilement and stronghold and every dumb thing we've done, which we've done a lot, I, at least I have, Everything we've done in the past, when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins and restore us by the blood. His blood reconciles us to God. We were his avowed enemies, and Christ died for us. We were his avowed enemies, and Christ sacrificed himself for us to reconcile us to God. The blood of Jesus Christ gives us victory over the accuser of the brethren. Thank God for that. Revelation 12 talks about they overcame him. They overcame the accuser of the brethren by the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, those accusations that we have about ourselves. You're not good enough. You're not worthy. You're sinful. 
You're selfish. You don't deserve this. God's mad at you. God doesn't like you. You failed here and you will never ever become who you're supposed to be. You're a failure. You're a hypocrite. You are condemned. There's no hope for you. Those accusations, I want to tell you, are from the devil. And you've overcome those accusations of the devil that wants to define you and say this is who you are. God says, no, that is not who you are. You are not defined by the devil's accusations. You are defined by the finished work of the cross, and you are defined by who God says you are in his word. It's the truth of who God says you are by his word that matters. And when you take the blood of Jesus Christ and you're coming under a barrage of accusations, you can say, I rebuke you, devil. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that drives away your accusations and say, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. I always fail. I'm not, I'm, I'll never be what I'm supposed to be. I'm under condemnation, hopelessness, despair. And we feel like we're just, this, all we are is this hopeless hypocrite. And God says, no, it's the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ gives you the power to overcome those accusations of the devil. His blood gives you peace. See, when we take communion, we're not just drinking some grape juice. When we take communion, we're coming in. The Holy Spirit then t begins to work because what happens is we're remembering. Faith is being activated. And, and the Spirit of God is now taking what's real in your position and making it real in your experience. He's applying the blessings and the benefits of the blood into your, real, into your real everyday practical life. So now the blood, that is, it's like it's, it's just coming into this agreement. The blood gives me victory over the devil. The blood gives me peace with God. See, you have peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. You've come into a new relationship, a new covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ, through the blood. The shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ in the new covenant brought you into an entirely new relationship, and a covenant relationship, a relationship secured by the sacrifice of Jesus, a relationship secured by the blood, a relationship secured by the body, the body of Christ. His blood, like we were singing about during worship, his blood gives us access to the presence of God. Like we were singing about, there's no reason, there is literally no reason why every local church cannot be a Jacob's ladder and have that experience. This was not just meant to be an Old Testament thing he encountered in a dream. Every house of God is meant to be a dwelling place of God and the Spirit, a connection from heaven to earth, whereby we experience heaven on earth and we worship before the throne of God. That's by the blood. We have access and this is also, I don't, I'm not giving the reference, scripture references right now, but that's, if you just do a word study on, study on the blood, you'll see all this. This is access to the very presence of God. We draw near by the blood. We draw near by the blood. We experience sanctification by the blood. I love Ro, uh, Revelation chapter 7. The saints, they're coming up out of the great tribulation. This is so, so beautiful. They've experienced the hardship in the Great Tribulation. They've experienced incredible trials, unlike anything anyone's ever experienced or, or close to anything anyone's ever experienced. And they come out of this, and John sees them, they're, and they're, their robes are winding. He's like, who are these? And the elder or one of the messengers said, I think it was an elder, said, these are the ones who come up out of the Great Tribulation, and they've made their robes white in the blood of of the Lamb. He's talking about a sanctification rooted in justification that comes from the blood. See, our onward, ongoing work of sanctification, you could say the bride being made ready, which is what we talk about so much here, the bride being made ready is rooted in that foundation of justification that in Christ you are righteous. In Christ, you have a status declared righteous. In Christ, you have this reality. You are not under condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. The condemnation and the wrath of God that was before Christ has been gone forever. You have escaped the wrath of God 
by his blood. And now you come into sanctification. You come into purity. You come into holiness as the blood cleanses you down to your innermost motive, heart, and thought. There is power in the blood. True. I'm not going to sing, think, because I don't want to make you just embarrassed or me. There is wonder-working power in the blood. There is power in the blood, power to sanctify you, power to justify you, power so you can escape God's wrath, power so you can overcome the accuser's accusations, power so you can experience forgiveness, power so you can come into the new covenant relationship, power so you can have uh, eternal life with him. The power of the blood. And so what happens when we drink from that cup? We're not just drinking grape juice. Yes, this cup, this This cup we drink from is a symbol, but what happens is as we open our hearts, the Holy Spirit takes that symbol and he brings you spiritually because you're you're unified with him spirit to spirit. He takes that symbol and he begins to apply by the act of faith the application of the blood so that you are now renewed and and refreshed and the grace of God begins to flow into you uh, in a fresh new way by the blood of Christ that you experience those benefits, that breakthrough, that holiness, that sanctification. That's the blood. The bread. Just like the cup, the bread is a sharing in the broken body of Christ and all the benefits of the broken body of Jesus Christ. We don't just eat the bread, eat the cracker, and, you know, thank God we moved away from the crackers we had during COVID, which were, I don't even, I don't even know if that was even, maybe plastic, it was so disgusting. <laughs> we, took, we took that onto our trip in Africa and dad wanted to take communion. I was like, oh, this is so, oh, what is this? I mean, this is like, piece of plastic. It was, anyway, thankfully, I won't go on that, that trail there, but thankfully we have better, you know, better crackers. That makes, makes it better, you know. But the, the benefits of the body of Christ, sharing in or experiencing the benefits of the body of Christ. And we, when we eat that bread, here's what we're doing. We're coming in to that spiritual experience the Spirit brings us into of what the body represents. The body of Christ, broken, represents spiritual emotional, and physical healing. Isaiah 53, talking about the atonement of Christ, said, by his stripes we are healed. We are healed. God's healing power, whether that's spiritual healing in salvation, whether that's emotional healing in our soul, whether that's physical healing in our bodies, all of that is All of that flows from the atoning work of Jesus Christ, the flowing of God's power through his fresh grace in the atonement, spiritual, emotional, physical healing when we partake of the broken body of Jesus Christ. The body represents the the union with Christ. And this is really, Paul unpacks this in in Romans chapter 6, especially Romans chapter 6, 5, is that we have become partakers. That word means, can mean grafted. Is, is what happens is when you're born again, the spirit of the living God is grafted to your human spirit. And when he's grafted to your human spirit, he then baptizes you into the body of Jesus Christ. And he baptizes everyone who's saved into the body of Jesus Christ. So therefore we are in Christ Everything that then is true about Christ is true about us in position, in our union with him. And then we identify then through our union with Christ. We identify with him in the death, the crucifixion, the death, and the resurrection. Listen, all of that is theological. All of that is just words, okay? It's meant to be something we come into and experience. We want to experience, like when Paul wrote Romans chapter 6, when Paul wrote that, he was writing from a place of profound revelation. And sometimes we read that and we turn it in just to doctrines and we turn it into theology. And I, I like doctrines and I like theology, but doctrines and theology don't help us of any, any at all if we don't come into the experience of what they're talking about. We've got to have more than doctrines. We've got to have more than theology. There's a lot of really smart people that have the doctrines perfect, that have the theology perfect, but they have no life and no experience. 
So when we partake of communion, God wants to bring us into that experience of the union with Christ. It's, some, some scholars call it the mystical union with Christ because it's, it's some one of those things that's kind of hard to explain, but God wants to take the mystery out of it. And, you know, when we, when we eat the bread, we're coming into that, that spiritual union with Christ that we are in him. We are in Christ. And though we, we did not experience physically the pain he experienced on the cross, and we did not experience physically death, and we did not experience physically a resurrection, spiritually we identify with it. That's now part of our history because we are in Christ. And when we're, when we're partaking of communion, we're coming into that, that reminding of our, our union with Christ. And then what that does in a practical way, Paul builds on that case in Romans chapter 6. He says, now therefore, because you've died with him, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. See, there's very practical implications of this union with Christ is now in your war against sin and your struggle with the flesh and those things you're trying to overcome. Paul says, listen, you died to sin. You died to sin. The power of sin, the power of sin that works in your unredeemed body, you have been delivered from it. That power of sin in your body, you have been set free. Now, that power of sin is still in your body that wants you to do things that are contrary to God's commandments. But if we, if we live by the Spirit of God and we live by the strength the Spirit of God supplies, that power that's at work in our body is now becomes dormant. It's still there, but it becomes dormant. So now we can live by the Spirit of God in freedom, in victory, in overcoming. That's the power of the, of the body of Jesus Christ. We come into union. We, we eat that bread and we come into Romans chapter 6, 5. We have been, we have been, uh, we are in now joined to him in his death, joined to him in his crucifixion, joined to him in his resurrection. The power of the bread the power of his body means we now walk in newness of life. The old, la the old life, it was crucified. The old man was crucified, yet we still try to resurrect it and live in it. But it's been crucified. The old mindsets, the old coping mechanisms, the old things we learned as children and, and that were developed within our soul, all of that has died in the body of Christ. And so therefore, we can now walk in this new life by the Spirit. Spirit first, soul second, body third. When we come into that divine order of the spirit-led life and what that means, God's newness of life begins to flow. His healing power begins to flow from the spirit into the soul. We begin to experience emotional healing. We begin to experience emotional wholeness. We begin to come into that union by experience where it's not just a mystical union or a positional union, but it's practical and it's real by experience. When we take of communion, we're coming into that reality anew and afresh. <clears throat> when we partake of the broken body of Christ, it's a reminder that we are in Christ. Jesus said that I will be in you. That's Christ in you, the indwelling life. And you will be in me. That's the positional our, our legal position in Christ, we've taught, taught a lot about that, whereby God declares you righteous, God declares you sanctified, God declares you victorious, God declares you ascended, all those things that God declares you crucified, all those things are part of it because you are in Christ. And we, 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 when we partake of that bread, we're coming into that experience of the blessings of being in Christ. When we partake of the bread, this is all laid out in Romans chapter 6. We're making that public declaration both to God and to principalities and powers that we are no longer a slave of sin. We have been delivered from the power of sin. We have been delivered from the bondage of sin, the chains of sin, the chains of selfishness have broken. We have come into the liberation of what it means to be a bondservant of obedience and a slave of righteousness. We're making that declaration because the body of Christ was broken. 
We are no longer under the law. We are under the very grace of God. That's communion. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Just so beautiful. Now let's flip over now to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. And Paul has that same theme in mind in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. This is really what the Lord had given to Terry as a word for us. We'll, we'll, start, we'll start in uh, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I had also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this is, the, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, getting into verse 26, for, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what we want to do is just walk through 1 Corinthians 11, 26-30, the context of this passage is similar to 1 Corinthians 10. It's a little bit different. What was happening in the context of this passage was the Corinthians, who were noted for their carnality, noted for their fleshliness, noted for their immaturity, they were coming to the Lord's Supper, and they were coming with an irreverent attitude. And some were taking the wine of the, of the representative of the blood of Jesus Christ, and they were getting drunk. Others were hungry and coming because they hadn't eaten all day. They were coming and they were filling themselves up with the bread of Christ. And so there was this irreverent, uh, nonchalant kind of attitude about communion. And Paul comes in and he's like, okay, you don't understand what we're doing. In fact, there's some of you here who are sick. There's some of you who have died because you did not discern what we were doing in communion. God's judgment fell upon the Corinthians because of their ignorance and acting in ignorance when taking communion. So when we, back to verse 26, when we take of communion, it's, it's not just an act of remembrance. It's also a proclamation. Okay, get that. It's an act of remembrance, but it's also a proclamation. For He said in verse 26, when you drink the bread, as often as you drink the bread, and, or drink the bread, you want to get a blender and blend it up, eat the bread, drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. There's both a proclamation of all the benefits of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Listen, we ne the, the cross has to become central the centerpiece of the church, once again, it is the very center of everything. We never graduate from the centrality of the cross of Jesus. Listen, we love the charismatic. We're in the charismatic. We love new words from God, and we love when the Spirit moves and all that, but I believe so much of the charismatic church has deviated from the central message of the cross because it doesn't provide that new and exciting thing we want and we're searching for, that dopamine hit. We've got to have the new thing. The cross is the very essence of our faith. And so when we take communion, as often as we take communion, we are proclaiming and remembering the death, the atoning death of Jesus Christ and the applications of his blood and body to us. It's not just a, it's not just a remembrance, but it's a proclamation of the atonement of Jesus Christ until the second coming. This is actually, this is actually related to the end times. As communion is related to the end times. It's what scholars call eschatology. It's, it is a prophetic declaration and proclamation that the king of kings whose coming has also died. The king of kings who is taking over the nations when he returns and all the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. This great king has sacrificed himself for the world so we could be reconciled with God. That's so beautiful. Just so beautiful what the Lord has done. Verse 27. This was the, the, the scripture verse that the Lord gave Terry as a warning to us, okay? Listen, if God has given us a warning, it means there's something in us that needs, to, there's some in us that, in this body that need to really take this serious. 
He doesn't just give a random warning to us just because he needs to fill space. God is, is warning us. I, I, you know, and it's, it's not to make, create a, make us afraid of God or afraid to take communion, but it is meant to jar us a little bit and say, okay, is there some, something in me that's not right? Am I not right with you in some area? And in verse 27, this is some of the most sobering words in Scripture. And Paul says that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's very serious, okay? I want you to, I don't think that the church has taught very well the seriousness and the sacredness that communion is if we just pass the elements around and drink it and don't even know what we're doing half the time and a lot of times we're living in sin and God in his mercy hasn't, you know, judged us. But in, in the Corinthians, he had. He inflicted some with sickness because of they were guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. He even caused some to die prematurely because they were guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. So, this is not, sometimes we can hear this and we can be like, well, I'm not going to even take communion. No, communion is essential. The response is not to be afraid of taking communion. The, the, the response is to be sobered and, and, and examining ourselves to say, okay, Lord, show me what needs to change. Show me where I'm living in sin. Show me where I'm, not, where I'm taking of this in an unworthy manner. And I would just say as a pastor, out of love is just, you know, if you feel like you're not there yet, it's better for you not to take communion than to take it in an unworthy manner. Because I do not want you to bring judgment upon yourself, okay? I've been to enough funerals this year, okay? <laughs> I'm kind of kidding, okay? But I'm, I'm, in a way, I'm serious. This is literally, if we take it in an unworthy let me explain what I mean by an unworthy manner here. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect, okay? I know there's some people who, who are very sensitive and they're like, okay, I said one wrong thing in a moment of weakness two years ago and I'm still beating myself up for that. I don't think I'm worthy to take communion. No, that is not what Paul's saying at all, okay? You don't have to be morally perfect, okay? Make sure you understand that. You don't have to be morally perfect else no one would ever be able to take communion. It's not about being flawless or perfect, perfected or any of that because no one would be able to take communion. What it means is that we can, it's really related to our attitudes and our unrepentant actions. Our attitudes, we take it nonchalantly and casually. We just kind of stroll in, not really preparing ourselves for communion, and we stroll in, you know, we've kind of barely get here. You know, we've had an argument with our wife on the way here, and we're just, you know, just strolling in. Oh, yeah, past the bucket, past the elements, and we take it, and we, we're just kind of this casual, irreverent, kind of unsacred uh, attitude we have that lacks the fear of the Lord. Um, now, I don't, th I don't think, like, God strikes people dead or that, that kind of attitude. God has mercy, but it, it's even deeper than that. But our attitude definitely, definitely leads to our actions. It's like the Corinthians. They didn't reverence the sacredness of communion, and therefore they were getting drunk off the wine, and they were eating the bread to satisfy their physical hunger instead of seeing what this act is, instead of seeing what communion is really to be. They were doing it with ingratitude. They were, they were familiar with it. I mean, how, how, how familiar have we become, as the church become, with taking communion? You know, as people say, familiarity breeds contempt. And so when we are familiar with the ritual of communion, it can actually create a contempt in us to where we're like, ah, pass the juice, eat the cracker, do it out of ritual and out of a mechanical mode of operation and that, that lacks the reverence and the fear of the Lord. We do it casually. We do it without honor, without reverence. We, in other words... We, we take the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God who was incarnated in human flesh. He was born to die, and he's the only hope for our salvation, else we would be in eternal hell. 
and he dies on the cross, he experiences the condemnation that we deserve, the wrath we deserve in hell. He experiences that on the cross as he has become sin and is the sin offering and his holy blood, which is way more precious than billions and even trillions of dollars, has redeemed us. And we come into this casually with this nonchalant, cavalier attitude and we say, well, we're just strolling in to eat this. Instead of realizing the immense price that Jesus paid on the cross to save us. He is our only hope. The cross is our only hope. The atonement is our only hope to escape the very wrath of God. Jesus substituted himself for us to save us from God himself. He substituted himself to save us from himself. That's the glory and the wonder of the cross of Jesus Christ. And when we take communion, we're entering into that atoning work of Jesus Christ. The cross is central. For all eternity, we will be singing of the cross. For all eternity, we will be worshiping and thanking God for his shed blood. And we're entering into all that that means. That's our attitudes. Now, our past unrepentant actions. Now, remember last Sunday I talked about that there's a difference between confession and repentance. You can confess your sins, and we need to confess our sins. Okay, sometimes we get a little confused. We need to confess our sins. But it's possible to confess our sins without repenting. Because repentance means, and this is just from the, the Greek word, what it means in the Greek, the Greek word for repentance means change of heart and change of mind. It's an internal change in our heart and in our, in our mind that leads to a change in our action and our behavior. Repentance is about transformation. Repentance is about change. Repentance is about no longer doing those things that we were once doing. Not just repentance. Confession is just saying, I acknowledge this is wrong. Confession is not repentance. But confession is part, or should be, or confession is definitely part of repentance, but repentance is not always part of confession, if that makes sense. So some of our past unrepentant actions coming, and this is why I would say, if we're living in unrepentant sin, I would advise as a pastor out of love for you, I don't, I'm just, I have no idea what everyone's doing behind the scenes. I do not know those things. God has not shown me. I don't really want him to show me. I'm just saying, as a pastor, I love you. I don't want you to come under God's judgment. But some unrepentant actions that I would say, if, you, if you're not yet to the place of repentance, then don't take communion. Don't bring judgment on yourself. A divided loyalty between self and Christ. Where, okay, I'm living kind of, I'm trying to fit Jesus into my life, but... He's not really my life. I'm still living for myself. I'm doing what I want, when I want to do it, and how I want to do it. If you're not to that place of coming to that place of full surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in every single area, and you're still living for yourself, I would advise not, you not to take communion until you've come to that place of repentance. Living in the flesh and practicing sin. Now, we all get in the flesh, okay? I was in the flesh Friday, okay? Just honest admission. You can ask Angie, you can ask Anna. I just felt frustrated Friday. I have no idea why I felt frustrated. I just felt frustrated. And I was like, you know, Angie would say something and I'd be like, Bleh! and just like blurt out something in the flesh. And finally I said, okay, hey, sorry, I'm just frustrated today. And then Anna got frustrated. We all were just probably some spiritual warfare, but we, I was in the flesh on Friday, okay? I was in the flesh yesterday at about 7 o'clock or 7.30 at night, until about 11.30 or 12 at night, watching the most ugly football game I've ever seen in my life. I was in the flesh, borderline like anxiety attack, watching the number one team in the nation, who should not be number one, by the way, almost lose to Kentucky, the Cats. Okay, I was in the flesh. So I'm not talking about just momentary struggles in the flesh. We all struggle with the flesh. We all get in the flesh. I'm talking about a lifestyle of living in the flesh, where you, the way you live is by the flesh. The flesh dictates what you want and the cravings you want, and you give into those without consent for the Spirit of God in you. And then you practice sin. 
If you're practicing sin, and with, and with, you can confess all you want, but if you're practicing sin, I would advise you not to take communion, okay? Uh, you, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking about a momentary anger or frustration, you know, like, you know, Anna, Anna recorded me, she, she was getting at me during the game, and she recorded me, and I'm like sending from the TV, like, blah, like giving the coaches, you know, a mouthful of what, you're, what all they're doing wrong, okay? I'm not talking about that, okay? I'm not talking about... You know, just a momentary thing in the flesh. I'm talking about a lifestyle. I'm talking about practicing. I'm talking about you're giving yourself to the, you live by the flesh and not by the spirit as a lifestyle, not just something you make a mistake or whatever. You see what I'm saying? Again, I don't want people to be afraid to take communion, but I want us to have the balance between the fear of the Lord and not being afraid to take communion. A big one would be sexual immorality of any kind. Sexual immorality of any kind. When I say sexual immorality, just to make it real simple, any sexual act, including pornography, outside of the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman. If you're in living in unrepentant sexual immorality, I would, adv I would advise you not to take communion because to be living in sexual immorality... And to partake of the Lord's communion and the atonement it represents is to regard it as common and not as sacred. It's to re regard it as unholy and, and not the holy reverence that it is. And it can actually bring judgment upon you, okay? So if you're living in that unrepentant sexual morality, I would, unless you are repenting, I would not take that. Worldliness, materialism, creating division. Half-hearted worship. You know, part of the, part of the thing that, that Malachi was talking about in Malachi chapter 1, about the table of the Lord in Malachi chapter 1 is kind of connected to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, is the, that they were giving to the Lord their lame. They were giving to the Lord their leftovers, the blind, the lame, the sick. And God was like, would you give that to your governor? He's being sarcastic. Would you give it to your governor? Would your governor be pleased with your half-hearted worship? Why would I be pleased with what your, your half-hearted leftovers that you're giving me? Am I not to be honored and re revered? See, we can, we, see, if we're giving God our leftovers, we're trying to just say, okay, I'm living my life, and I'm just going to live how I want to live and how I want to live and the way I want to live, but I'm going to fit Jesus or at least try to fit Jesus into my life and say, okay, you can have this, but you can't have that, or whatever. We're still dictating the schedule, and we're still dictating our will, and we're, but we're still kind of this mixture of trying to mix in worship with him, with it, living for ourselves. And then we give God our leftovers. That with, that, what I'm saying is communion, partaking of communion, God deserves our very best, our absolute best, our absolute surrender. He must be Lord. He must be Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? This is about lordship. This is about surrendering to the lordship of Jesus Christ and saying, have your way in me. Have your way. So, Paul says that if you take it, that's what it means to be, to take it in an unworthy manner. And if we take it in an unworthy manner, this is, this is sobering. I, I don't know if there's more sobering words in Scripture. We're guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That's, that's, some, that's, that's the truth, but man, it's sobering, isn't it? Not to, you know, in Hebrews chapter 10, there are those who practice sin willfully, and they, they treated the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as common, like it was just the death of an ordinary man. Same kind of dynamic is at play in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, is we're just treating... This juice, this bread as grape juice, crackers, or in the case of the Corinthians, as wine we get drunk on or as 
bread we eat because we're hungry is kind of like Eli's sons who were eating the temple sacrifices and sleeping with women and doing all this. We're just mixing in the, the carnality and the flesh with the Lord's table, not regarding the, what communion is, that it's not just a ritual, it's not just a mechanical thing we do. It's meant to be an experience by which we come into the, a fresh encounter with Christ. And, and Paul is saying that to do that in an unworthy manner, you are guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. And thank God, we, Angie's teaching the youth. Some of our kids are like, well, I'm not sure our youth, <laughs> my, my kids should take a communion. Well, thankfully, Angie's teaching that right now. So, you know, it's like, I'm not, I'm not, th this message is not meant to be about don't take communion, all right? It's meant to put more of a fear of the Lord and, the, and a recognition of what it really is in us. I, I hope everyone will you know, do that necessary self-inspection, unnecessary repentance in preparation. And I hope every one of us will be able to take communion. But my, my, the warning Paul gives us is if we do it in an unworthy way, then we bring judgment upon ourselves related to we are guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. That's some serious, serious charges. I mean, that is like fear of God, fear of God stuff there. Okay, if we approach communion with the right attitude, you know, we, we approach it in the fear of the Lord, we approach it with clear understanding of its significance, what the body represents, the, body rep, the blood represents, and we're not living in unrepentant sin, we should not fear partaking of it, okay? So if we do it the right way, we should not fear partaking of it, and in fact, Partaking of communion is a profound encounter with Christ. It's a profound encounter with Christ. And it's a way of, I believe, as we approach it in faith with right understanding, we'll come into a more deeper exper experiential experience or experience of Christ in a deeper way when we understand, okay, this is not just ritual. We're coming into an experience with him. Verse 28, Paul says, but a man must examine himself. Now, this, we talked about this last Sunday that Paul said, I don't even examine myself. I think what he's meaning here, he's not contradicting himself. What I think what he's meaning is we don't examine ourselves just by our own, our own self. Because a lot of us, we, we know there, there's, there we have some, a lot of us, some, some of us sometimes we can have self-hatred. We can be like so ashamed that we did this or did that and God doesn't want us to just come into this morbid introspection where we find every single thing wrong with us. It's supposed to, this is meant to be spirit-led. Okay, Lord, show me what you want me to change. Now, if you're living in clear sin that Scripture clearly lays out, like I listed just a minute ago, you don't need the Holy Spirit to tell you that. Scripture has already told you that. You know, if you're living in immorality, repent. If you're living in... Sin, repent, those things Scripture uh, lays out. But I'm talking about more of the, the inward thoughts and attitudes and motives that, that, like, okay, Holy Spirit, what is it that you want to shine light into where I need to repent? And so we examine ourselves, not in our own self-abilities, but we rely on the Holy Spirit. We rely on God in prayer, okay? Lord, is there any areas in me where I need to repent, where I need to change? And in so doing, this is what he says, a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. So the communion is meant to come out of self-examination. Verse 29, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks, listen, judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. Again, very very sobering words, very sobering words, that when we, when we partake in communion and we don't examine ourselves, we bring judgment, God's judgment upon us. Why well, didn't think God judged those in the new covenant? <laughs> what scriptures were you reading? I've gotten into debates about this with people before, and I'm like, what scriptures are you reading? You're coming into the scriptures with your mind made up when scripture's very clear I mean, it's very, very clear. These were, these were Christians. These were those who were in Christ. 
They were in Christ, yet they're, they were flippant. They were casual. They approached God and with their, without reverence. And therefore, they brought judgment to themselves because they did not judge the body rightly. In other words, what, what that really means is that they did, not, they did not discern what the bread represented or the cup represented. They did not discern the price Jesus paid in the atonement and the great price that, that, that God paid so we could be reconciled with him. They did not discern the weightiness of sin and the absolute need for righteousness and the price Jesus paid on the cross so that we could be reconciled to God and righteous in him. He, they did not discern those things and therefore they ate with this irreverence and, God, and they brought judgment to themselves. God did not judge them initially. God judged them in response to them bringing judgment upon themselves. Verse 30, for this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. So in other words, what, what Paul was saying is that, and listen to what he said, there, for this reason, many, I don't even know how big the Corinthian church was, but many among them were weak, not just a few, many were weak and sick and some slept. Okay, let me just say this. This is not teaching, this is not teaching that any time you sin, God will inflict a sickness on you, okay? Jesus is the healer. We just said about the atonement. Healing is in the atonement. Jesus, just read the Gospels. He was a healer. He is a healer. This is not saying that if you sin or even living in sin, he's going to inflict you a sickness. He's saying if you commit a particular type of sin, you open yourself up to judgment. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Because I can see like, okay, some people have so twisted this thing to say, okay, well, I got, I'm sick and therefore God's judging me. No, no, no. He's your healer, okay? This is in context to a, a specific sin of living in unrepentant sin and living in unrepentant sin and then partaking of communion and bringing judgment upon themselves because they did not judge the body rightly. Does that make sense? God's not out to inflict you with sickness if you make a mistake. God's not out to inflict you with sickness if you sin. God's not out there waiting to strike you with lightning if you make one small mistake. That's not the nature of God. But when we approach communion and the, the sacrifice of his son and the sacredness of that sacrifice and all that means if we approach communion without recognizing and discerning the body and what it means, then we can bring ourselves under his judgment. And I don't want that to happen to any of us. I don't think you want it to happen to you either. Okay, heavy, challenging, awesome, encouraging. The point of this is, just to bring it to a close, the point of this we are not, okay, please do not be afraid of taking communion, okay? We're going to take communion next Sunday, and then I think we'll take communion, I'm thinking maybe the month of October we'll take communion just in, to respond to Terry's word. Then we'll get back into the regular taking communion once the first uh, Sunday of the month. Um, but I just, the challenge for us is to say, okay, don't be afraid of taking communion, but fear the Lord and examine yourself by the Spirit of God. Okay, show me the areas where I need to repent. And spend this next week in preparation, spiritual preparation to say, okay, Lord, examine me, show me. Lord, where do I need to change? Where do I need to repent? And then do that and come in and then we take of communion as a body and, and probably we're just going to just devote that Sunday, next Sunday, to that, that sacred moment of taking communion together as a body to say thank you for the work you have been doing in us. And we give ourselves wholly to you. We remember what the blood and the body represent. Amen. 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 Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. We are just eternally grateful for the great love you have for us, Lord, truly. Lord, we deserve hell. We deserve eternal separation from you. But Lord, you were rich in mercy. 
and you came as a man. You substituted yourself for us to save us from yourself. And we just want to say with gratitude in our hearts, thank you. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the sacrifice. Lord, thank you so much for the atoning work of Christ. Thank you, Lord, that your blood justifies us and cleanses us. Lord, I pray that as we prepare for next Sunday in communion, Lord, I just pray that you would reveal to us those areas where we need to change and repent, Lord. Lord, I ask you for the fear of the Lord to be increased in our hearts, Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we just say, God, just pray you would, you would do business with us, Lord. Let's just stand right now and just open our hearts to the Lord. This is in preparation, all of us, for, for next week, next Sunday.